Well, hey, everybody. You okay? <laughs> All right. As I prepared for this sermon, I started thinking back through the years of my childhood, and a phrase kept echoing over and over in my mind. My poor mother. <laughs> the things I put that woman through. I was, by way of example, um, an extremely picky eater. And I remember the conversation sitting in the pediatrician's office where my mom said, Dr. Foley, I don't know what to do. The boy can't possibly eat pizza for breakfast every day. And Dr. Foley said, Connie, relax, it's okay. If he wants to eat pizza for breakfast, let him. It's got all the four basic food groups. You got your crust, that's your grains. You got your tomato sauce, fruits and vegetables. You got your sausage, your pepperoni. There's your meats, your proteins. And then you got the, the cheese. Oh, the cheese. <laughs> There's your dairy. And I remember, thinking back on it now, I, now that I look back, I'm thinking maybe pizza might actually be a superfood. <laughs> you, you think? I didn't know what that was back then. All I knew back then was that woman, Dr. Foley, who tortured me with needles, suddenly became my best friend. <laughs> because I then, just like now, love pizza. And you may say, Brandon, that's a little silly. You don't love pizza. You have a fond affection for pizza, maybe a little too much. But you don't love pizza. To which I would say to you, yeah, I kind of do. <laughs> but I get, I get your point. Like We throw that word around love a lot, don't we? In, in our culture, uh, our, uh, uh, we look back in, even in the Bible, the Greeks had different words uh, for love. We see words like phileo, right, which is like a brotherly love. We know uh, from other Greek literature about eros, a romantic love. Agape love, the love that God has for us, the love that we show back for him. None of those are really how I love pizza. I get that. Unless, of course, you let pizza stand for something else in your life. Something for which you have an unhealthy but faithful affection for. And to which you run anytime those other areas of love let you down. You go to those faithful affections because they won't let you down until they do. Because they can't possibly bear the weight we're trying to put on them. They can't give us what we're asking for. And so we just become this cliche. We're like an old country song. Looking for love in all the wrong places. And we lay awake at night and we wonder, am I really loved? But we will not find the answer to that question. We will not find true, real, lasting love until we understand what love really is and who love really is. So stand with me, if you would, and honor the reading of God's Word and turn to 1 John. This is the second week in our 1 John series that Jay introduced last week. Go ahead and turn to chapter 4. And we will read just one verse from that. It's already on the screen. You probably read it three times already, but it's good exercise to help your Bible drill skills to turn it. It says this, we love because he first loved us. Let's pray. Lord, I just pray right now that whoever's in this room, wherever they are, they would hear exactly what you want them to hear, regardless of what I say. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks. You guys can be seated. We love because he first loved us. 
a fantastic summary statement to all the things that we see in chapter 4 up to that point. So good, in fact, what I would really love to do today is just take that sentence and kind of exposit it, just kind of walk through it and let that sentence be our outline. If you're following along in your bulletin, uh, your e-bulletin, as it were, you'll can, you can see that I've given you that. Uh, I'll have it on the screen as, as well. Uh, but it tells us, this sentence, just about everything we need to know about love. Now, throughout the letter of 1 John, remember it's always helpful when you're reading a letter to know not just who wrote it, but who they wrote it to and, well, why they wrote it. And Jay introduced this idea for us last week that John was trying to refute some false teaching. There were some people who had removed themselves from the church because they thought different. Okay? Now they're trying to send people back into the church to try to influence opinion. And what they're trying to teach is, is heresy. They're, they left the church denying the actual humanity of Jesus Christ. You know, they were fine with the fully God part, but the fully human part they just weren't on board with. Okay? They were denying the idea of sin uh, as, um, as something that was effective uh, and therefore uh, the, denying the need for obedience. Uh, and they were honestly just kind of being jerks. They weren't loving the people in the church. And so we see all of these things in John's response. He says a lot about Jesus in the flesh. He says a lot about sin versus obedience as a fruit of our saving faith in Jesus Christ. And he offers his readers a reassurance. No matter what you hear, you know the gospel. You know Christ. You are saved. Last week. But he also offers a reassurance in yet another way, another proof of genuine and saving faith, and that is love. And so that's where we're going to be today. So look back at this verse. We're going to take it kind of slow as we break it apart. Um, but uh, look at uh, 4, 19 one more time. Let's read it, okay? We, stop right there. Is that too slow? Somebody's like, we're going to be here forever. Who is the we? Now, this is how I love to read my Bible, especially in the epistles, this fancy word for letters, right? So especially in the letters, I like to take it, and I'll just take a word for granted. I want to know, what's that word there? What, what is it there? What do you say? What's that word there? there what's that? No, that's the therefore, therefore. Yeah, forget that. That's a bad illustration. All right. What I like to do is I like to take that word, and I want to see what it means. And so when I see the word we, well, who's we? Is he talking about the church? Like he's talking about believers? Or is he talking about all mankind? We love. Because, I mean, all mankind knows how to love, don't they? I mean, we're made in the, the image of God. Everybody is. And we just got through reading, if you were reading the letter, in chapter 3, where, where John says that God is love. Humans get it. Or do we? But the problem is that image of God is, is broken. We have the ability to give love. We have the ability to receive love. That's an attribute of God. But we can't do it correctly because what we see as love is a shadow of what love really is. Even our real relationships, our deep relationships, we're not seeing them exactly the way Christ images them. We can only see that for what it is in the context of our relationship with him. So remember the context of the letter that I just told you about, John refuting these false teachings. So it makes sense that he would say, we love, because he's drawing a distinction between his church, the people in his church, and the false teachers. So we versus the heretics that think they understand, we really do. Because in verse 8, he just got through saying, whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. So that's we, that's us. We're the children of God. Can you think of a place in Scripture where Jesus kind of gave us a, rec a directive about the best way to, to love? What about love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind? This is the greatest and most important command, he said. And then he followed up and said, the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So that's us. We are the we there, and that's our standard. That's where it begins. That's where it ends. So... There's we. You guys good with that? Can we move on to the next word? We love. 
Now, we just talked about who the we is. So the we informs the next word. We love. Not they love, but we love. So now that we understand who we is, how does that inform how we love? So again, image of God. And so the Greeks have got all these words. Phileo, eros, we already talked about. we got storge, that's like a family kind of love. And there's a bunch of others, right? But this agape love that we see in, in, in biblical Greek, agape love, that's, that's something completely different. That's not something we can do on our own. Jesus looked at his disciples and he said, Greater love, that's agape in the Greek, has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Now, sometimes we'll go to the movie theater and we like to watch these like action movies. You know what I'm talking about? So like things blow up a lot and there's always this hero and like he's flying around and jumping around and taking out the bad guys, and rescuing all the people, putting his life on the line. You know, Darlene calls those bang, bang, shoot 'em ups. That's what she likes to go see, the bang, bang, shoot 'em ups. And so we will walk out of the theater. Are you like me when you walk out of the theater after a movie like that and you're just like, I hope somebody tries to take me down right now. <laughs> I know what to do, Right? Yeah, you're so excited, right? You're ready to put your life on the line to lay it down for anybody, any moment. That's not love. That's delusion. (laughs) I would fold like a cheap suit if we did that. Agape love, that you would lay down your life for your friend, is selfless. It's intentional. And it's otherworldly. You cannot understand it. It has to be given to you. It has to be given to you so that you can see it through Christ's work on the cross. At best, our human love, the way we understand it, is still a shadow. The love for our spouse, the love for a best friend, the love for our kids... I was playing a board game once with my daughters when they were little, and I brought a picture just so you could see kind of the ages they were. Mackenzie was about eight at the time, and Mackenzie was starting to get really good at the board games. You know what I mean? Like a little too good. Like I need to take her down a notch. You know what I mean? So we're playing this game, Sorry. Do you remember that game? Yeah. You realize what the subtitle of that game is? The Game of Sweet Revenge. Why do we even play this with our children? So I'm playing this game, and it's that, that moment, and she's doing great, blowing us all away. But there's that moment when I roll this certain thing, and I could take this marble and move it over here, or I could take this marble and land on her, send her all the way back home. Wee, wee, wee. Right? <laughs> Don't you think I did it in a heartbeat? I took that little overachiever, and I sent her home faster than you can say, tough love, baby. <laughs> About three minutes later, I had another similar opportunity with Riley Grace. Sweet little four-year-old Riley Grace with those big brown eyes that looked at me and that lip that started to quiver. Because what is he going to do? Now, I've never been accused of being a stoic. I'm actually kind of more like a marshmallow. So I caved in the moment. I said, honey, don't worry. Daddy wouldn't do that to his little girl. (laughs) Y'all know what's coming now, don't you? I looked over, and Mackenzie's big blue eyes were brimming with tears. And her lip starts to quiver, and she said, But I'm your little girl, too! Why couldn't we just play Candyland? Because I spent all night in the molasses swamp. I'm just telling you right now. It was a horrible experience. And that's, that's human love at its best. That's a father playing games with his daughters and making memories. Memories that won't ever go away. <laughs> but imagine human love at its worst. When we are fallen people loving others in fallen ways. And what do we do with that? We try to impose that on God. No, I've seen the way you Christians love. It's not for me, but thanks. Or maybe somebody in your life has deemed you unworthy, unlovable. And you figure if they think that, 
God probably does too. You're too broken. You're too ugly. You're so unlovable that there is no one that can love you, not even God. Dane Ortland, in his book, Gentle and Lowly, says this. Every human friend has a limit. If we offend enough, if a relationship gets damaged enough, if we betray enough times, we're cast out. And the walls go up. With Christ, our sins and weaknesses are the very resume items that qualify us to approach him. Did you hear that? Our brokenness, that makes us lovable to Christ. And he has no limit. His love is perfect. It is agape love. And we know it because of our relationship with him. We love because. Now, I love this word because. You know why? Because you know what it means? It means our love for God, it's a response. Our love for God is pure worship for what he did for us. We recognize that it is completely outside of us. We receive it and then we can give it accordingly. And we can give it not just back to God, but to others. That's how it works. Again, by way of the work on the cross. Now that's the second time I've said that phrase this morning, the work on the cross. So can we just drill down on that for for just one second? Because the last few words that we're going to go over here, they kind of tell a story. And we we call that story the gospel. So let's walk through as we get prepared to walk through the gospel and talk about this Christ work on the cross thing. Look at the next word. We love because he, he, who is the he? John could stop right there, I think. We love because he. We love because God. Isn't that enough? God created. He created us. He created the world. He created all these wonderful things in the world, like pizza, right? He's a loving creator. And when he paints, he dips his brush in love. It coats everything that we do. It is his very nature. We love because God. But that picture is incomplete, isn't it? That's not the whole story. You see, the whole reason that image of God I talked about earlier is broken is because man didn't decide to love God back. He decided to love himself. He went his own way. He took God out of the center of his life and put himself in it. And so now, generation after generation of us are doomed to disobey. We have been kicked out of the garden we have been pushed away from God's presence of our own doing and are doomed to spend eternity that way eternity separated from God but God made a way back he came to earth to reconcile us back to him back into his presence how through the incarnation, through the coming of his son, Jesus Christ, to earth. Remember, 1 John is writing against the heresy in this church that Jesus wasn't fully man. So he makes it very plain here. Jesus Christ in the incarnation, that's the he that he's talking about. And he says, if you don't believe in that guy, then you don't know love. He loved but we love, rather, because he first. First. That's interesting. Do you realize that Generation Z, our children, are the most photographed generation in the history of the world? You know that? I know you know that. You know how? Because you took the pictures. Yeah. And we can't help ourselves. Our kids are just so stinking cute. And we want to post them all over the place to sites we didn't even know existed with weird names. We can't help it. Because it's like they're, well, they're walking around and they're like little images of us. And we love ourselves. It is what we do. 
And unfortunately, not only has it filtered into our social media, it has also started to filter into our faith. Because we have a whole group of believers now who kind of think that the reason that Jesus came and died is because we are just so stinking cute. We make it about us. We have confused God's grace and mercy with our own narcissistic nature. So now on one side, you got half the people who think they're so horrible, God could never love them. And then on the other side, you see, we've got half the people who think they're so amazing, how could God not love them? So what is John trying to say here? Because he first... Well, look back in your Bible at 1 John 4 and look up to verse 10 really quick because he says this. Love consists in this, not that we loved, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for what? For our sins. Now, in the margin of that in your Bible, if you don't mind to write in your Bible, I want you to write Romans 5, 8. Romans 5, 8, because Paul says this, but God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We didn't even know we needed God when he did all of that for us. First, he did it. We didn't. Love comes from God before it can ever go to God. God. We can't give or receive love unless we understand the only love that is actually worthy to give back to God is the one that he gives us via the atonement on the cross. That's good news. First is good news. You know why? Because human love is laced with fear. Human love is laced with fear. Think about it. When you tell someone, I love you, there's a very real chance that they will not say it back. Or even if they do, you can't trust it. That's why saying I love you is so scary. That's why it feels so good when somebody does say it to you and why it hurts so bad when they they don't. But we don't have to doubt with God. Because he loved us first. I love you is not our line. Our line is, I love you too. I love you because. Even though I know where I was. I know what I deserved. I know what you did in spite of it. We love because he first. We love because he first loved us. How did he love? Well, the Bible tells us. He loved us by not considering equality with God as something to be held on to, but instead he emptied himself by putting on humanity, coming to earth and being obedient, even obedient to the point of death on a cross. That's how he loved us. And then he didn't stop there. When he rose from the dead, he looked at us and said, follow me. Follow me. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you've done. I want you to live. I want you to live in the freedom that comes from a life of holiness because of what I did for you through my love. We never get there. I heard John Piper say last week, there's a difference between walking out of prison and walking into the arms of your family. We always talk about getting out of prison. But just past Easter, we talked a lot about him coming out of the tomb. Did we not? It's one thing to believe all of this. It's another thing, though, to accept it, to rest in it, and to live it out. But John writes this letter to give us assurance of our salvation, our ability to live it out because of God's love. And boy, we need that assurance, don't we? We need that reassurance over and over again. You know why? Because what we try to do is we try to find our assurance, not in this love, but in our our friend group, in that person that we're, we're dating right now, what our bosses think about us. 
You know what that leads to? Rejection. Doubt. Guilt. And so we turn to those familiar affections again. Those fake loves. Counterfeit cures for our broken hearts. It's like taking leaky buckets to empty wells. We go back and forth and there is nothing to satisfy. And John knew that. He tells us in chapter 3 that when our hearts condemn us, when, we should know that God is greater than our hearts. God is greater than our hearts because he knows everything. Verse 18, right before the one we read today, says that perfect love casts out fear. Perfect love casts out fear. What kind of fear are we talking about? Well, obviously, if we're talking about salvation, there's fear of condemnation. If you have that kind of perfect love, not the kind of love that the heretics are over here talking about, but this kind of salvific love, you have no fear of condemnation. So why do we keep living in fear? Why do we keep loving in fear? Fear of rejection, fear of failure, fear, failure, or fear that we're not enough, that we're not loved. Listen, nobody's going to kick you off the island. Nobody's going to send you out of the garden anymore. But we live that way. We live like we're wandering in the land of Nod, full of fear. But God calls you back in because of his love. Peter was having a really bad day. Here's the leader, ostensibly, of the disciples. Friends with Jesus. Perhaps, arguably, one of, if not his best friend. And so, Peter and John go. They get things prepared for the Passover meal, as Jesus asked them to. And when it comes time to sit down, finally, after working, the only seat that's left for Peter, we think, by putting the pieces together is the worst seat at the table, the servant's seat. The seat where, if you're in it, you're supposed to wash everybody's feet, which Peter does not do and realizes it about the time that Jesus gets up to do that. So Peter argues with Jesus. You are not going to wash my feet. And Jesus rebukes Peter, if I don't do this, you can't have any part of me. So then Jesus starts talking. And he says, by the way, I'm going to leave. And where I'm going, you can't go. Then he drops the bigger bomb. One of you is going to betray me. Peter wants to know who it is. But Jesus' answer is not clear. So Peter takes his opportunity. He says, look, I'm not going anywhere. I'm staying right here. I will take care of you. I will stay until the very end. And Jesus, his friend, his Lord, looks at him and says, no, you won't. By the time the sun comes up tomorrow, you're going to betray me. Not once, not twice. Three times, Peter. Oh, and by the way, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. This is not a good night for Peter. So later they go to pray. Jesus is incredibly distraught. He asks Peter and the others, please stay awake. Please watch for me. Please pray for me. I am grieved to the point of death. And he comes back twice to check on them. And what is Peter and the other guys, what are they doing? They're sleeping. They are so grieved themselves. They are so scared. They are so exhausted that they can't deal. Once again, a rebuke. And then they go to the garden. Here come the temple guards to arrest Jesus. And Peter decides he has got to make good on his promise. He has got to prove himself. He has got to show that he is the one that will never abandon Jesus. So he takes out his sword. And either it's really dark or he's got bad eyesight. Because I don't think he was aiming for dude's ear. You know what I'm saying? I think he was aiming to prove a point. And so Jesus heals the man's ear and once again rebukes Peter. 
Live by the sword. Die by the sword. The next time we see Peter, he is in a courtyard being harassed and fulfilling Jesus' prophecy. Denying Christ three times. When Jesus is hanging on the cross, Peter is completely AWOL. We have no idea where he is. I can't imagine what Peter was feeling in that moment. What he was going through. But I can't imagine what it felt like. Sunday morning, when those women came to the room and started banging on the door. We've seen Jesus, and he's alive. And you know what he said? He said, go and tell the disciples, oh, and be sure to tell Peter. Because he needs to know. It's okay. It's okay. I'm alive. There is hope. God will not give up on us. He will not consult our past to determine our future. He loves in a way that we cannot without him. And he loves not because we deserve it, but he actually loves because we don't. Once again, gentle and lowly, Jesus does not love like us. We love until we are betrayed. Jesus continued to the cross despite betrayal. We love until we're forsaken. Jesus loved through forsakenness. We love up to a limit. Jesus loves to the end. We love because he first loved us. Last word. Later, Peter would find Jesus on a beach. And he would have breakfast with him. And in that moment, Jesus would ask Peter, Peter, do you love me? And Peter would say, yes. Yes, you know I love you. Three times Peter would affirm that. And each time Jesus said to him, then feed my sheep. The us there, strictly speaking, goes with the we at the beginning. So we're talking about believers. But because of John's other writings in the whole of Scripture, we do know that God loved the world in this way. We know that he wills that all would come to a saving faith and knowledge of him. So I feel perfectly comfortable standing here before you today and saying he first loved us, us meaning everyone. That means he wants to use you and me, the we, to reach the us. You see how that works? He wants us to be his hands. He wants us to be his feet. And guess what? He wants us to be his image because of how we love one another. That's what he's laid out. That's what he's designed. And so that is our application point for today. There is an undeniable link between Christ's love for us and our love for others. Chapter 3, John 1 says we're not supposed to love each other in word and talk. But in deed and in truth. And then as we love others, our love for God is perfected. Some of you may remember my friend Eddie. Uh, Eddie came and spoke at my ordination um, uh, just under a year ago. Eddie was a minister for us in college. And he was that guy you never forget, you know. I mean, he was gentle. Um, he was Christ-like. He was nurturing. He was loving. He wasn't just a minister. He was my mentor. And he was the kind of guy you hate to disappoint. But I did. I failed him. I put him in a difficult spot. And he had to come to me, and he had to let me know. He was not unkind about it. But uh, I was crushed because I had let Eddie down. And I had all day to think about it because that night we had another event and we were there and we were all worshiping. And I looked up 
and I saw Eddie across the room and he was walking toward me and in front of everybody he walked up and he put his arms around me and he said I love you and I'm sorry you're sorry I'm the one that was wrong and he's the one he's the one holding me that's how we love people love walks across a crowded room no matter what's happening, no matter what's going on, and wraps its arms around the guy who is desperate for your love, desperate for your forgiveness, desperate for your acceptance, even though he's the one that's wrong. Why? Why is it you that's supposed to do that? Because that's what Jesus did for you. That's how he gives his love to you. That's how he wants you to use that love to love others. And how? 1 Corinthians 13 is pretty helpful. Got some good takeaways. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. It is not boastful. It's not arrogant. It's not rude. It's not self-seeking. It's not irritable. It does not keep a record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. And it bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. And it endures all things. If you keep reading in 1 Corinthians 13, it says near the end, Now these three remain. Faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. Why? Well, it could be. It could be because when I was a child, I I thought like a child. And I reasoned like a child. I loved pizza. And I loved my mama. And that's all I needed to know. But now as a man, I see a bigger picture. I see how people have failed us. I have failed others. I see our our struggles. I see when things happen to us. Sometimes really bad things happen to us. And that's why we have faith. That's why we have hope. Because faith and hope show our trust in God's control over our future. Got it? Faith and hope show our trust in God's control over our future. Love, though. Love shows our trust in God's control over our past. Over forgiveness. Over acceptance. That's what love does. It makes us able to move forward. And to then share that hope and that faith with others. Are you really loved? Oh, that you would know the length and the width and the height and the depth of God's love for you. Let's pray. We, Lord, rarely stop long enough to really pray, to really commune with you, to really talk with you. And when we do, we're bombarded with all kinds of things, things we're supposed to do, things we're worried about, ways we've been hurt, ways we've hurt people. And it all just bangs in there like bumper cars, and we don't want to deal with it, and we can't concentrate, and so let's try this another time. But those are the very things you want us to bring to you. So here in this moment, If there is someone in this room that has never felt your love, that has decided that some facsimile they saw somewhere, some imperfect human love, stands for you instead of what we see in the scripture, break through that, Lord. Reveal yourself. 
to them. Save them. If there is someone here, Lord, who is back, who has made it back to the garden, you have drawn them, they have believed in you, and they're still living and loving in fear, wandering in the land of Nod, chasing after some counterfeit cure for their broken heart. Break through that. Reveal yourself to them because there is a world waiting for them to share your love. Church, however, you need to respond to the Lord today. Use these next few minutes in the still and the quiet and listen and respond. Let's pray.